Hey, we're back with the Metal Blade podcast. I'm Vince from Metal Blade Records, and who else we have here, man? I am Riley McShane from Allegion. And I am Ryan Williams, also from Metal Blade Records. You know, I feel like we should explain why that was as awkward as it was. It's because we're all very far away from each other right now. In our yeah. respective homes. Yeah. All all hanging out doing the uh doing the remote working thing. Uh yeah. So we re- relaunched this Metal Blade podcast uh a few months back and we got a few episodes in the can. Um, but then all of this coronavirus stuff happened and we felt that it would be weird just to launch these episodes where we don't even mention it. So we're doing a redo of the first episode so we can kind of address all the current happenings. And it doesn't seem like we're living on Mars or something. And uh, yeah, so we could kind of talk about everything that's going on and uh, and address it. So this is actually, what's the date today? The 4th? Or no, it's the, April the 6th. 6th of April. It, yeah. See, that's the, the thing, right? Working from yeah, home. No idea what the, date it is. The concept of dates and times really don't matter. It's kind of nice because I'm kind of working, you know, I'm working during the day when I usually do, but I'm also coming back to projects at night or taking long breaks during the day just to keep my head clear. Cause especially when you live and work in the same place, you start to get a little stuffy, right? Uh-huh, totally. So yeah. yeah, it's, it's been fun to kind of manage that. And thankfully I enjoy working, working from home. Uh, so for me, the adjustment isn't huge, but I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that really are going through some pretty significant adjustments to life working from home. Well, and oh, yeah. we're just lucky that we uh, have jobs that we are able to work from home. You know, I mean, obviously the restaurant business, uh, you know, a lot yeah. of different businesses, record stores. I mean, almost everything has been hit super hard um, and especially touring, which is, you know, one thing yeah. that is very relevant to us. All the tours have basically been canceled through at least June, as far as I'm aware. Yeah. Um, Riley, you've had a, a, a tour cancel, no? Yeah, we were supposed to start tour four days from now um, and then go through like the, the first week of May. Um, but yeah, that, that, is, uh, that is postponed. We're working on trying to get it back on for like third quarter of this year. Yeah. But it's, you know, who knows at this point? It's like such a, it's such a total mystery. That's the the worst part about this whole thing is that it's like, you know, I think the last I heard, like the most recent thing to get everything back on track and get the economy going again is uh, not necessarily a test for if you currently have uh, COVID-19, but right. if you have had it. The antibodies. Uh, right. They think it's like a, like a chicken pox type of thing where it's like if you have had it, and you are fine and non-symptomatic anymore, then like you're not going to pass it to anyone else and you can return to the workforce. Um, right. So ideally that will be rolling out soon, like within the next month or so. And then, you know, things can kind of start returning to normalcy. But at the same time, it's like, you know, if none of my band or touring crew or any of the people on the band, you know, all it takes is like one or two people to, like fail that test so to speak to be like oh well i never had it like i guess i'm still at risk uh to still like throw a wrench into everything so it's a uh, it's definitely been a a, a trying time but it's also been kind of cool because it's like seeing how all these creative people are coming up with creative solutions to like still work and still do stuff instead of just like coming to a crashing halt you know yeah yeah well we we put out uh the the allegion cover of yes's roundabout just this past friday and the plan was to have that out to help promote the fact that you were all on tour so that's the other thing too is we have things on the release schedule that they're too soon on the schedule to move and no one's really sure if we need to move things yet and certainly some things on our release schedule are definitely moving uh, in response to this but yeah, like you said, we put out two videos on Friday uh, to promote Roundabout. So yeah, we're still releasing really cool videos and a lot of people are streaming. Like Devin Townsend is yep. releasing a bunch of tracks. He had Fetty from Death Rage, uh, who, uh, Riley, you talked to for one of the first episodes of this podcast, uh, Come oh, yeah. Back at NAM. So it, they're collaborating over obviously vast distances and electronically it's pretty cool to see the people that are taking advantage of this and i think i really hope we'll see more musicians take to things 
platforms like Twitch. Yeah. I actually just did a similar collaboration with uh, uh, my friend who plays drums for Venom Inc. Um, he's doing this oh, yeah. cool like song in a day thing. Yeah, Jer- Jeremy Kling. Yeah, Jeremy Kling, exactly. Yeah, he drummed uh, in the absence. I worked with him. Uh, back oh, he did drum in the absence. I played yeah. with him in Necromancing the Stone. Oh, yeah. That's right. And we worked with him again then. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, he's a good he, dude. He, uh, he uh, hit me up. It's funny that I, you know, I like totally forgot that despite having toured with Necromancing the Stone with him playing drums. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was like, oh, how did I meet that guy? Oh, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, he hit me up to do like this cool song in a day project that he's doing uh, where he does like one style of metal like every day, every other day. And uh, the day I did was a, a Florida death metal song. Uh I I just wrote the lyrics and recorded from home in a day and sent it to him and it was uh it was super fun and it's you know it was it was a cool way to like bring other musicians together that might not work with each other if things were like still operating normally um yeah. you have you know just on that track it was Myself and then Taylor Nordberg, uh, who plays bass uh, for Soil Work when they're touring. Um, Taylor also played in Necromancing the Stone for yep. that tour. Yep. Um, and then uh, Chase Bryant, who plays bass for Warbringer. Um, he also played bass for Oni, who we toured with. Uh, and then uh, me on vocals. So it's like, it's cool, just like dudes that I haven't seen in forever. Uh, and then if you look at the other people that are in that little project that he's doing, uh, it's just tons of people from all over the world, really, that are just doing all these like fun little kind of out of the box styles of death metal. So it's uh, it's 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 really neat seeing everybody come together uh, in this kind of trying time. Yeah, I mean, we still have the internet. We still have um, ways to collaborate and make things. So it's not like creativity has to come to a halt. You know what I mean? And yeah. I think people are at home and they wanna they wanna hear new stuff like the um you know code orange kind of did that live stream when their album came out and i think they had probably planned that out beforehand and it kind of came right as the shutdown was was coming in um and yeah that stream was just far too professional to be a last minute thing right yeah one of the better live streams i've ever seen a band do yeah and that was perfect and i think we're gonna see maybe not stuff like that because bands can't necessarily all be in the same room easily but just more utilization of of streaming in general and you know i'm seeing people every day now go live on ig and facebook and you know slagle's been doing that and people are really liking it so i think we're going to finally see all of this uh, technology that was kind of on the periphery start to come into focus and people really figure out how to use it and there's a lot of bands that are still kind of on the fence and like looking at it and waiting to see but you know, more, the more tech savvy people, I think, are jumping in and just using it, like exactly like you said, that collaboration that you were just involved in. That's awesome. Yep. Yeah, it's super fun, and it's it's you know, I've been Twitch streaming for years, as we talked about in yeah. you know prior episodes, and uh, it's it's just really cool seeing. Like, I've had tons of people, uh, you know, within my field, you know, bands uh, that I've toured with, and you know, just dudes that I am, you know, talk to in the death metal scene. Uh, hit me up for like lessons on how to set up Streamlabs OBS and like right. how to get your Twitch all hooked up and all that kind of stuff. And it's just super cool seeing all these dudes, um, you know, m- move their viral marketing into that direction because it's it's been there for such a long time. Um, and like you said, it's just kind of been on the periphery because it's you know hard to fit learning something like that into a schedule of really any kind. But now that nobody has a schedule yep. really of any kind, <laughs> uh, it's, it's neat seeing everyone, you know, just utilize the tools that we have. Yeah. And I, I think one of the things bands that I've found tend to fear about streaming is that, you know, bands have a lot of contact with the public through things like Twitter and Instagram. And sometimes it's not always positive positive. And I think what I've found with streaming is that the people that tune into a stream and converse are overwhelmingly positive compared to random Instagram comments. So I think there's a little bit of bands are afraid to do it, but once they do it once or twice, they realize it's actually a pretty fun experience. And people that are on Twitch like new people joining Twitch 
because you're kind of joining um, almost a subculture in a way, right? I, and the reason I'm so confident even labeling it, labeling it as such is I was at TwitchCon 2019 and I saw Dragon Force play uh, there and people that worked at Twitch were excited that people from Metal Blade were there. And it really did have a vibe that people are really loyal to Twitch as a brand. Um, totally. Yeah, it's it was really it, being at TwitchCon during the opening ceremonies where they're talking about the platform and all the things they're going to be doing to make it better. And then the crowd applauses was like something out of a movie where it's a few steps away from a cult. You know what I mean? It was, <laughs> yeah. it was weird. It was like kind of surreal. Um, but it, it, it wasn't bad at all. I, I've, you know, I think there are a lot of bad companies out there. And so far, my experience with Twitch is pretty positive, I'd say. Yeah. And it's and far easier. Like the, the numbers you need to generate revenue on YouTube are in the millions. Right. Um, oh, yeah. To generate oh, yeah. any amount of real ad share revenue, it takes a long time. Whereas Twitch, the barrier to entry for affiliate status is relatively low. And even if you don't have affiliate status, um, you can, if, if you know the ins and outs of like, you know, partnered apps like Streamlabs and Stream Elements right. and all that kind of stuff, you can start generating revenue immediately like right out the gate you can set up a donation button in your bio and you know set up a chat bot to be like oh you know click here to donate to the stream kind of thing uh affiliate status really i mean uh, of you know the revenue that i do make on twitch you know limited as it may be 90 percent of it comes from that donation button and that, uh, that's true too yeah a lot of streamers do have donations outside of anything involving twitch yeah. Um, what, which one do you, uh, Streamlabs has their own thing, correct? What, what is they, it called? They do, but I use Stream Elements uh, for okay. mine, just because it's a little bit more streamlined, no pun intended. Uh, right. But it, it's, uh, you know, you just click the button, it takes you straight to this like really nice looking, easy to navigate page. You just type in, you know, type in the amount, type in a little message, you know, hit send, and then it just goes straight up into your notifications, pops up on the stream, all that good stuff. Uh, That's great, yeah. But yeah, the way the way the Twitch structures their uh, their payouts is uh, pretty like far away from each other, kind of thing. So it's like if you are streaming a lot in like December, right, as an affiliate, uh, and you're getting tons of subscriptions and people are giving you tons of cheers and all that kind of stuff, you don't actually see any of that percentage uh, that you make after Twitch gets their cut until. I want to say like first month of March. I think it's like a 90 day oh, okay. first week of March. So it's gotcha. like 90 days after you start doing things. So it's like, if so you're it's like a quarterly payout type of thing, right? Well, no. So it's like, it's, it's basically, I want to say that it's like 90 days from when you make the money. So if you okay. start streaming in December, right? Like you won't see your first deposit from Twitch until March. But if you're also streaming all of January, then you'll still see that deposit in April. So it's not like they're only paying you out on right, like 90 okay. day brackets. It's just 90 days from when you're making the money. But if you're you know trying to generate revenue in like a meaningful way, uh, especially in today's climate, 90 days is a long time. So yeah, uh, having absolutely. that having that you know uh, immediate donation button is is really helpful for people who haven't even reached affiliate status yet. So there's it's it's super cool that you can just like log on, set everything up, and then just you know start generating income. Nice. Yeah. So that kind of brings me to another point: is um, is kind of monetizing your brand and your band in general. And I was actually reading um, Devin Townsend actually wrote this little book on creativity. And I was reading one. I'm actually going to read a quote from it because it kind of informed uh, my opinion on this quite a bit. Um, So here it is. Uh, A decision that I had to come to at one point when I realized that I was making a living from music and I needed to sell it is that although I don't like selling things, I need to. It's a practical reality of being a human on this planet at this period in time. Therefore, I need to embrace this and and learn not to be either afraid or embarrassed of it. And I think... I can personally speak to that as, you know, having been an artist or whatever, that after you're done creating something, it kind of almost feels like sleazy and scummy yeah. when you have to like absolutely go into the marketing aspect of it and you're selling everything. And I was one of those people who's like embarrassed of that part. And and I think that that quote is perfect because 
you know, we live on this planet and to get by, we're going to have to sell things. And if you make art, you can't be embarrassed of selling your art. And yeah. that's something that I think a lot of artists need to get over. They kind of want to have this, um, this mystique and this mysteriousness, like Trent Reznor or something where everything's artsy and you're not out there like pushing your brand. And that's cool. But I think that we're moving into a place where if you're going to be a successful artist, you have to monetize everywhere possible and not necessarily be like a kiss or something where you're selling like bobbleheads and shit, but like, yeah, yeah. you have to not be embarrassed of selling your art. And, and Riley, a Legion has a, uh, a Patreon, correct? Right. So maybe, um, can you talk a little bit about that and about just monetization yeah. of your brand in general? So a- absolutely. So I think that as a musician, I, t- I totally agree uh, with, you know, pretty much everything that you were saying. The only thing about uh, the metal community in particular, um, and it's it's changed a lot for the better, I think, uh, since we launched our Patreon, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, but when we launched our Patreon, we got tons of clapback right. uh, from the metal community for launching a Patreon. Right. Um, and Heavy Blog is Heavy actually wrote a really, really cool... Uh, like four piece essay on suffering in metal and how it's like an inherent part of the culture. And like, if it's like, right. People freaked out because, and they like kind of didn't really know why. Um, and you know, certain media outlets put like a, you know, a clickbait kind of spin on it where it was like, Oh, band threatens to break up if they don't get money. And it's like, come on, bro. Like, that's not, that's not what you said. What we're saying here. Like, (laughs) yeah, yeah, yeah. We were just kind of putting it on all on the table being like, look, if we don't start, you know, generating income, then like, we won't be able to do this much longer. Uh, and you know, that turned into like band threatens to break up holding fans hostage. (laughs) Uh, but, (laughs) but, uh, but no, people still got kind of pissed off because they were just like, how dare they like ask for money for their hobby? Like how, you know, just like work hard. Like if people don't like you, then you should just break up kind of thing. And it was just like, well, it's not really how it works. And so, like I said, heavy blog wrote this, uh, really kind of cool thing about, suffering in metal and how it's this like inherent expectation and like a lot of fans as soon as bands like crest this mountain where they're comfortable and they're no longer suffering they're like oh they sold out like oh they don't have like metal cred anymore and you get this like really elitist uh kind of pretentious attitude coming out um and so sometimes it's hard to like take that that leap because metal has always been like a you know a voice of rebellion like very not mainstream kind of thing so when you take advantage of mainstream tools you know that you see like podcasts and you know more mainstream musicians and all that kind of stuff uh when you take advantage of tools that you see people like that using the metal community kind of automatically gets a bad taste in their mouth because they're just like oh these guys are selling out um like I said I think that that's changed a lot over the past what almost 4 years since we started our Patreon mm-hmm. Um, and people are just kind of like coming around to it being a thing. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's hard sometimes in metal to, to, to do, you know, as Devin says, and like, even if you have that realization of, you know, you can't be afraid to sell stuff and you can't be afraid to market your brand. Sometimes it's like, you have to navigate how to do that so that you're not, you know, rubbing you know, people who kind of already have a tendency to be a little bit more uh, scrutinizing, you know, the wrong way. Right. So, um, yeah, I think that then that, you know, also has a lot to do with, I think, why, you know, so many bands up until this point have been hesitant to do things like Twitch streaming and, you know, other stuff like that. Uh, Because the only people that you see you know, at least in metal that are Twitch streaming that are like wildly successful at it are like Matt and Herman uh, from Trivium and Dragon Force. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it's like, you know, these guys in like more middle of the road bands or even like better, you know, well to do bands, I think can sometimes kind of look at that and like Vince said earlier, you know, visualize all this negative clapback that they're going to get and just be like, ah, I'll just not do that. I'll just wait. So yeah, and, and look, if, if it wasn't working and the experience was poor, I don't think people like Matt and Herman would continue to do it. Yeah, and, no way. And wh- one, of the, one of the responses I had to Allegiant 
and the issues with Patreon when that launched was, you know, if people like Dr. Disrespect and Ninja are worthy of uh, support from fans, then why not one of your favorite metal bands? And ultimately, what I think Patreon and Twitch are an extension of fan clubs. How long has Metallica had a fan club? Yeah. Uh, Metallica hasn't wanted for anything since the fucking Reagan, Reagan administration. <laughs> so what there's really, it's extra money for them. But if people weren't getting something out of it, they wouldn't put money into it. And that's really, I think the importance of something like a Patreon or a Twitch stream, people are going to support if they feel like they're receiving an equal value, like a Patreon. If you're doing those tier subscriptions, what are you getting for that? As long as the artists and the creators are providing something of approximate value to the fans to make it worthwhile. I think it's a great experience in a lot of the, the music business and where it's going is super serving super fans, whether that's really high end vinyl and CD packaging, Blu ray, which really doesn't sell at all anymore, but super fans might buy a, bl- a live Blu ray and things like Patreon and Twitch. It's just extensions of that. And I, I, f- I think it would be a really sad world if fans didn't want to support musicians in that capacity, right? I mean, who, how crappy would that be? <laughs> totally. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I think that, you know, if I could, you know, whip up a time capsule and go back to 2016 when we were launching our Patreon, uh, knowing what I know now, I think that that's how I would have chosen to market it. Um, Nabla Viscaris was the only other band in the metal world that had like, done the whole patreon thing and they got a bunch of clap back when they launched theirs as well but they kind of approached theirs from the same like businessy like you know here's how the industry works and here's you know kind of like uh you remember when protest the hero made that video uh when they were crowdfunding that one record and they like gave the breakdown on like how like the back end split kind of goes uh people like latched onto that because it's it, 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 it's information that like you know the average consumer and average listener doesn't know or think about um and so you know people kind of latched onto that and were like oh i had no idea here let me you know help you guys you know escape the evil clutches of the music industry um <laughs> which is kind of silly uh but you know we went from a, a less extreme version of that because they were trying to like go fully independent and what we were trying to do was just kind of be like, look, like, here's how it works. Like, here's our take home at the end of the day, at the end of a tour, you know, and at this point in our career between tours, it's like not really enough to keep us afloat. You know, we also can't really get day jobs because we're also, you know, at this weird midway point where it's like we tour, you know, tour enough to not have normal home lives, but don't tour enough to, you know, like live off of that. So here's this, you know, solution that we're trying to come up with. And like I said, in retrospect, I don't think that was the best way to go about it. I think that doing the whole like, hey, this is just a fan club. Like, if you want to join our fan club, we're using this website. It kind of looks like Kickstarter. Not really the same thing. Uh, It's got the tiers and all that stuff, but it's monthly. You know, here's what we're offering. If you want it, jump on board. Um, That makes sense. Yeah, Yeah, and I've actually had uh, one band specifically ask me, you know, hey, we're looking at potentially creating our own app and delivering exclusive content through that app. And I said, yeah, that's Patreon. Yeah. Yeah. And they said, well, we kind of want to make our own app. Great. Um, use Patreon. <laughs> why, why would yeah. you, you, we kind of, you know, if you're someone big enough, I don't know, Toby Keith. Yeah. Maybe you can make your own app, but for everyone else that isn't at the peak where they command millions upon millions of uh, listeners, Everyone else essentially has to go where people are already going. Um, it just doesn't make any sense to try to get people to go to a website they're not used to or download a new app because the you're just not going to get enough people. And that's the other thing, too, is uh, I, I've seen a lot of people come up with all these wacky ideas. No, just Twitch and Patreon. Use the platforms you already have rather than trying to bring people to something new. It's just... People are in their routines and they're not going to really probably try a new platform to spend $5 to buy a concert ticket to see a stream show. Like, why wouldn't you just put that on Twitch? Yeah. In my opinion, anyway. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Um, it's like you said, I think that I, 
I think that what draws people to ideas like that is uh, the idea of something new and something like fresh and something, you know, branded uh, to be, you know, their particular. Sure. Yeah. You yeah. Know, they, they can like push that marketing being like, look at this new thing that we have exclusive, you know, exclusivity and all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, chances are, I mean, you know, and, and I, who knows, maybe they do, uh, but chances are they have no experience running an app. And it's like, what's right. going to happen? Yeah. What's going to happen the first time that app crashes? Do you have like a tech dude on deck to be like, oh, hey, no, it's no problem. I'll fix this thing. Like there's already very well oiled platforms uh, that deal with this kind of stuff and mass that are available. So why not yeah, just and it's u- be use easy. those tools? Yeah, it's got to be easy for the band or the creator to use. It can't be something that's custom to where it's a hassle to push out updates or create or something. And that's really why... Patreon and Twitch, I mean, are so popular, they're relatively simple to use. And yeah, I mean, how many bands right now don't have a full-on website because it's difficult or don't have a mailing list and things like that? I often find um, it's easier just to keep it simple. And sometimes people tend to overthink and try to get a little, little too elaborate or complicated. And, you know, that's just not a good idea for most people, I think. Yeah, 100%. Keep it simple. Keep it easy. Man, this shit's this shit's heavy. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's a crazy but time. It's, it's heavy times, man. I mean, we we definitely want our favorite artists to continue, and if we want that to happen, it's going to take us supporting. I mean, continuing to help out when and how we can. Just you know, yeah. And that's the other that's thing. It. If if you guys are sitting at home and you don't have a lot of spare money right now, you can stream stuff on Spotify. Uh, basically for free and you know, it's, it's a tiny amount, but it, it does help artists. So, yeah. you know, keep streaming, uh, order, you know, mail order from, uh, your local shops. I mean, order takeout. I mean, if you can afford it, we have to try to keep, uh, keep yeah, some local of this, restaurants for sure. Yeah. Man. Keep some of yeah. this stuff going as much as we can, you know? Yeah. The focus on local economy, you know, I feel like most of everyone is in like a guilty pleasure, like, you know, hometown group you know what i mean on facebook like the one i'm in (laughs) is is called escondido friends and it's just like a cesspool of like everybody who lives in my city (laughs) um but (laughs) but uh you know it's 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 been cool at least seeing you know different groups like that and people sharing different groups like that uh on social media and how everybody's kind of rallying to support these local businesses that are you know city favorites and and staples uh to the town that are struggling right now uh you know yeah much much more so than you know the 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 corporate installments uh of the same thing right so it's 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 cool seeing people i don't know this whole thing it's like i'm really trying to look at the silver lining with this uh totally this 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 whole giant shit show um you know creative people coming up with creative solutions you know, people turning their eye back onto small businesses. Uh, you know, it's 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 almost like traveling back in time. Like it's kind of it's kind of crazy. It's like I feel like I'm living in that like glamorized '80s dream world where everyone is like working together and super supportive and you know d- d- trying to better themselves for the sake of the world. And it's like, oh, this is kind of almost nice. You know, minus the whole horrible disease part of it uh <laughs> so yeah i i would just i would prefer the apocalypse to be a little bit more cyberpunk and neon you know <laughs> i mean neo I've got, tokyo looking i've got those like super cool light panels and light led strings all over my house i'm, I'm gonna yeah. go if i have hey, to stay here <laughs> so so by the way speaking of roundabout so yeah. That song we we've all learned now. I didn't really know until you brought it to my attention that it's highly memed. The original oh, yeah. yes version, highly it's used, memed. It's used in the credits of a show called JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. Ryan, have you watched this? <laughs> no. I finally w- started watching. Riley, you're gonna hate me because I'm you know I'm not true, but I've been yeah. watching the <laughs> the dub version of JoJo's yeah. Bizarre Adventure, not the sub. It's okay. It's I forgive you this once. One of the most unglued insane pieces of anime i've ever seen in my life it's, it's amazing where can i see it's it? fantastic uh it's, crunchy it's roll a, fun funimation any any one of those anime streaming sites okay. where are you watching it vince 
Uh, it's on Hulu as well, but oh, I, yeah. do, I do also uh, still have a Crunchyroll subscription. I think that Hulu and Netflix both have some of the episodes, uh, but I think that Crunchyroll is the only one that's like Everything. up to date. Yeah, okay. like does like simulcasts when new seasons drop and stuff like that. It's, um, it's definitely one of the most unique things I've ever seen. It's so fantastic, especially yeah. that first season when they're just like, you know, first dropping all the like classic rock homages in the characters' right. names. Like Jojo is the only one who's not named after yeah, right. a, the, uh, a classic rock band. Like, the main the main <laughs> enemy's name is Dio. Okay. Um the the main friend of Jojo, his name is R E O Speedwagon. <laughs> yep. Robert uh, Robert E. O. E. O. Speedwagon. Speedwagon. Yeah. His, and he, his teacher like, is Zeppeli, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Hold on. Hold on. I, I'm going to type here. I have to look this up. I have to look up the voice actor. I knew that voice actor's name almost immediately. Or not his name, but I knew I knew that voice actor. Holy shit. I have to find this. So wait, See, I've, I've never explained the I've tie in the English one. Explain the tie into roundabout to me again. <laughs> okay. So, so the credits, uh, the credits for the first season, basically it's like, you'll hear the like intro, like the like, bring, like kind of ring out. As they're like still talking about stuff and, you know, they're about to do like an action scene. And then basically it's like every episode almost kind of ends on like a cliffhanger or like a freeze frame. Okay. And basically when the freeze frame happens, this little arrow flies from the side of the screen and says to be continued. And then it's like as they freeze frame, the baseline for roundabout drops. in. Oh, okay. Um, Cool. And so then they roll the end credits to the first like minute and a half of roundabout. Oh, nice. Um, so the thing is, though, is that like because JoJo's isn't a new uh, series by any means. And so uh, a few years ago, people started using that freeze frame to be continued format as a meme. And so <laughs> if you tie if you go to YouTube and you type in, you know, to be continued compilation, you'll get a million and a half videos of just people making these to be continued memes. And it is like, uh, it's a, it's a meme format. I wish never died, but you know, Hey, now that we have a version of roundabout, hopefully it'll come back. There you go. So nice. You know, so doing the meme world of service. I, I found it. Robert EO Speedwagon is voiced by voiced by this guy, Keith Silverstein. He plays Ronan in Warcraft. Ryan, you probably don't remember Ronan, but you do remember Ronan. It was a character in wrath of the Lich King. The guy in Dalaran that said, citizens of Dalaran, raise your eyes to the skies and observe. Like every hour okay. in Dalaran. Okay, right. That, that guy. So his voice, <laughs> I've heard him do that so many times playing Warcraft over the years that as soon as Speedwagon started talking, I had to look it up because I didn't know that guy's name. But yeah, just, you know, one of those cool voice actor things you find. That's great. That is amazing. I, uh, I should watch more English dubs because I like... I would love to be in the voice acting world. Uh, I've tried to break into it a couple times, but it is like breaking into Fort Knox. Like it is very clicky and very, mm. you know, you, you got to know somebody kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, but even still it's like, it's so much fun and I'll do voiceover projects, you know, just sign on to Buford casting club every once in a while and just like do a, a few lines for someone here and there just cause it's like so fun. So I, I really should, listen to more English dubs for animes, but I'm, you know, I was, I was born a subs man and I will die right. a subs man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's, um, it's a fantastic show. It's a, uh, it's, it's really good. I highly recommend everyone watch it. Uh, the thing is though, is that so, so after the to be continued thing came out, uh, you know, obviously Jojo's had like really grown in popularity since then. And so another kind of like sub meme of that, was the uh is this a jojo's reference and so you have like 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 tag pages on facebook being like you know someone will post a meme and they'll be like is this a jojo's reference and it's really used in reference to like anything anime related and so my favorite part of seeing roundabout drop has been just how littered every comment section on every outlet has been with is this a JoJo's reference? Nice. <laughs> it's it is uh, it brings sunshine to my day. It's amazing. Well, and that that's the smart thing about that cover, right? Is not only did 
it get the attention of Prague fans. It just got added to the Prague Metal playlist on Spotify yesterday, by the way. Or yep. Was it today? Uh, I can't remember. Uh, I think time, it was, again, yeah, time has no ago. meaning. Yeah. yeah, time has no meaning. Here we are. <laughs> uh, what what day or year is it? I I have no idea. Doesn't uh, matter. But it, uh, just like subdivisions that you guys did before, this is it has a really positive response. So it's getting the attention of some Prague fans, but also the entire fact that people do know the song from JoJo's. It's crossing like genre and format boundaries and getting people's attention. Yeah. That's you know things like that are things bands need to do these days to get people's attention. Yeah, I know, just just think, think it out loud a, a bit there in that one. But yeah, I mean, hey man, do, doing something notable and memorable, you know, it sounds obvious, but it's turned out. So I, I didn't really realize how recognizable that song was from JoJo's until really it came out in the the comment section was flooded. So yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, it's it's easier said than done, and that I don't even think was like our intention going into no, it. That no, that yeah. was just kind of something that like me as a huge you know giant fucking weeb uh, was just like, oh, <laughs> this is the JoJo song, ha ha ha. Uh, and then you know now looking at like every comment section, I'm just like, oh my god, this is amazing. Yeah, and so, Greg originally wanted to cover that, right? Uh, Greg wanted to do Machine Messiah from. Okay. I can't remember what album drama i think it's from like they're for their like early 90s album uh oh, wow. and then i wanted to do uh heart of the sunrise or close to the edge uh heart of the sunrise is also on fragile and close to the edges it's kind of its own album but close to the edge is like 18 minutes long oh, uh, so that was a, a no-no and uh <laughs> and heart of the sunrise is only you know well only i should i should say uh compared to relatively compared to roundabout is only 10 minutes long versus the eight and a half that roundabout is um but it's just like not as well known of a song. And that was kind of my deal with Machine Messiah. I think Machine Messiah would have been easier to turn into a metal song. But everybody knows Roundabout. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's it's one of those songs that, you know, even people who aren't Yes fans, like when Roundabout dropped, it was like hot on the radio for, you know, like 10 years almost. Um, you know, even classic rock stations now still play it uh, for people who still listen to the radio um <laughs> but yeah, yeah. uh but it was just such Let's, a hot song and you know I've, I've been seeing tons of comments as well from like the older crowd being like oh my god i loved this song when i was in my 20s and they did such a good job and blah, blah, blah. it's fucking it's pretty pretty cool breaking breaking boundaries with roundabout yeah and it's so so easy for a metal band to make a song metal and make people hate it yeah yeah that is for sure but uh, that's you know and yeah, there's a little bit of that too you know what i mean people being like Meh. It gets well, too that, muddy. You know. There's no dynamics. And I'm like, eh, well, uh, I, I have this, uh, this really good philosophy that I, that I adopted once I started, you know, getting a little bit more attention in, in music. And it's uh, never take criticism from someone that you wouldn't take advice from. We talked about that on the other episode. And it was, I think that's a really good piece of advice. Yeah. No, yeah, totally. 100%. Yeah. So. yeah, well, well, speaking of advice and um, talking to people that know what they're doing, uh, should we send this to the, uh, the Jarvis Leatherby interview? Yeah. We had a chance to uh, join on Skype here with uh, Jarvis Leatherby, or join digitally in however way we figure out best to do it. Uh, you you know him as the bass player and vocalist of Night Demon, but he also manages a bunch of bands and is behind putting on the Frost and Fire Festival in Ventura, California. He's an old school aficionado. He's uh, one of the guys, essentially, uh, one of the main people responsible for the resurgence of underground traditional metal in the U.S. Totally. Nice. So, yeah, let's uh, let's see what he has to say about things. We, we've got Jarvis Leatherby here joining us on the Metal Blade podcast. Uh, you know Jarvis from Night Demon, Sear Thungle, and he manages a bunch of bands as well as part of his management company, Iron Grip Management. Jarvis, what's up, man? What's up, Vance? Did I get any of that wrong? Yeah, I, no, that's that's all right, man. Okay, perfect. That's it. Yeah, that's 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 not all, but but that's the important stuff. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, totally, man. So, there's already been some tour cancellations, of course. Um, you know, th this is a weird time, and we've been addressing things bands can do on this podcast to kind of stay busy during the downtime. What have you been doing so far? Man, it's kind of a weird thing. I I've been busier than ever. Like I'm, I'm too busy right now. I don't like it almost. <laughs> it's kind of a weird thing. I mean, there's a lot of good things 
about that too. Obviously when a lot of people aren't, you know, like I've got friends where like their jobs, you know, they've had jobs for like 15 years and then their jobs tell them like, Hey, yeah, don't come in for a month and we're going to like turn off your email. Like what, <laughs> you know, like crazy stuff like that. So for, for me, I don't know. It's like, we had a lot of stuff get canceled. Obviously I think night demon had almost 80 shows canceled. Jeez. We were going to be on tour basically right now for the next two months. And then Sierra Thungles had a bunch of festivals canceled. And I, well, everybody has obviously, but basically every band that I'm involved in or, or managed was affected by it as far as having something canceled. So, you know, we just kind of roll on with that. I mean, there's nothing you could do about that. You know, I mean, stuff that's just out of our control, you know, I mean, that's, most people's fears are things that are out of their control anyway, you know? So, um, but for us, I mean, I don't know, Night Demon's putting out music. We just put out a single last Friday. So we already had that on the books and obviously the Sarah Thungle releases, you know, it's like all that stuff was done right before this. And, you know, that's kind of a first in my career. I'm usually like, you know, if, no matter how prepared I think I am, I'm always like the last minute, like you know you're handing in mass a master last minute or artwork or whatever and you just got to live with it you know but but this time around it's been we've been fortunate in that in that fact you know and um it's weird like i, I kind of feel guilty with like the sales have been really great you know and i'm kind of like almost like i hope people aren't wasting their money on <laughs> you know not that not that it's a waste to buy vinyl you know what i'm saying but so I'm sure some people don't even know if they're going to have a record player in a few months, you know, but yeah, that, that is, that is a little bit of weirdness, right? Asking fans to support when they might not have a job themselves. Yeah, exactly. So, but you know, I mean, we, we put out this night demon seven inch last week and we didn't do a, uh, any pre-order or, or an announcement. We just, we just kind of thought, well, when this thing's ready, let's just do that. You know, I just got tired of pre-orders for a minute and at the same time, it's like now, like you kind of wonder about that business model. Like that's, it's like, you know, you don't want to pay for something like that's novel three months in advance when you don't know if, like when, what's, what you don't know what three months from now looks like, you know? So I think like the instant gratification thing, at least on a business end works for us in some weird way on some unplanned way, you know? And cause we sold out like within three hours. So I thought I was going to have some of these for a year, you know, <laughs> Yeah. after all this stuff broke out. So I guess, you know, I mean, there's been some, there's been some small victories, you know, in, in my business world, you know, and, and they, in the creative world, you know, the band, you know, all these night demon guys, we, we see each other every day and we still, you know, we're still uh, making music and, and doing a lot of cool stuff and, you know, doing a lot of video stuff. We already had a lot of this stuff planned for 2020, um, you know, getting into a lot more um, documentation, you know, video wise of what the band is doing. And so I don't know for us, it's kind of weird. It's like a perfect storm because the, the other side of it was normally we'd be on tour right now. And there was a lot of things that I'm not going to say I wasn't um ready to do but i just wasn't as prepared as i wanted to be so for me it kind of gave me a little bit of a clean slate it's like everything that i had on the books is just off the table so it's like okay like a lot of a lot of stress was taken away when that had happened because obviously it's happening to everybody right so it's kind of a level playing field for everybody kind of just evens everything out um which is kind of nice like you know you can't you know i don't know like for kind of for the first time it's like you know, on a Saturday, like this last weekend, I was like, I'm not going to answer my email today. You know, I'm just not going to do it. And like, it didn't matter, <laughs> you know, nobody cared. <laughs> it, it does feel a little bit uh, like a clean slate. It is, yeah. you know, so it's I think that this is a good time for people to like really, you know, kind of look inward and reflect, especially if they're spending a lot of time on their own, you know, I mean, some people, um, you know, like I can imagine for some people that, that like live on their own. I mean, they're spending a lot more time by themselves right now that they probably normally used to, you know, and like now's not a time to freak out. Now's the time to be like, all right, look, the world is changing. It's out of my control. There's nothing I could do about it, but like, there's like 99% chance I'm going to survive this thing, you know? And so who am I going to be when 
when things do get back to somewhat get back to normal, you know, cause a lot of industry is going to change too. You know, a lot of people will not have a job and a lot of, you know, I'm sure a lot of businesses are probably like when they weather the storm too, they're thinking like, well, you know, I can't just hire everybody right back because, you know, no matter how much the government says they're going to take care of you, <laughs> this is not, you can never believe that, you know, this is a time for humans to take care of humans and not rely on the government because these these fools do not know All what right. time it is. You know, yeah. they're not gonna no amount of money they're gonna give you is gonna change your life, you know. Well Saint Saint Vitus in Brooklyn just launched a Kickstarter. What's that? Saint really? Vitus in Brooklyn just launched a Kickstarter. What are you talking about? The venue, Saint Vitus. Wait, it's gone? No, they they launched a Kickstarter. I'm I'm type typing this up right now. Yeah. Oh, for what? Uh, St. Vitus Relief Fund. So, oh, wow. like to save the club? I guess so. Yeah. I, I didn't look at many of the details. Yeah. And it, that's it's what a hard it is. thing right here. You know, th- th- this is the thing. I've kind of taken the stance where it's like, <sighs> all right, like you, who are you going to donate to? Everybody needs it. Right. Right. So it's like, it's just not, I, I'm more about, I've taken the stance of like, look, I'm still an artist, you know, or I still, I'm still, you know, I still have a business and I still have a product from uh, that, that we can sell, you know, like basically if I can provide a service, then that's worth the donation. You know what I'm saying? It's instead of just, cause it's like, <laughs> like who would feel right starting a GoFundMe right now? You know, I definitely wouldn't, you know? Like it's, it's hard. It's hard to do that when, when everybody is in the same situation, you know? So I think right now is when you have to like dig deep and like, you know, start going on street corners and tap dancing, you know, or like, <laughs> right. you know, open that guitar case up, you know, like, uh, it's like, you have to trade goods for a service, right? Something that people want. And if you're, when you're in entertainment, if your fans want to be entertained, you've got to provide them with something, something good you know and i think a lot of cool art is coming out of this period you know i don't know how all you guys are but um or where everybody lives too because you know i'm in ventura and it's like you know it's been like a ghost town around here and it's been really nice like i still go out all the time you know i don't hang out with people but i go for like you know i walk probably six to ten miles a day and like through the, you know, on the beach and through the orchards and stuff like that and through town. And like, I'm definitely social distancing myself, but I'm getting out there and it's like the air is clean. People seem to be like pretty respectful of each other and really nice. Like it doesn't, you know, it seems like crime has gone down, even though most people you see are like the undesirables, you know, <laughs> they're like, they're the <laughs> ones that are out there, you know? And then I kind of think to myself like, well, if they're out here and I'm out here, then I must be like an undesirable as well you know so <laughs> well i don't blame you ventura rules every time i've gone out there i thought why don't i spend more time here yeah it's real nice man i mean you know even right now i got out of the office for a minute and i'm just like sitting in my car out in the fields here it's just like pretty nice like oh yeah you know i think we might get a little bit of rain i kind of feel like like uh it's funny because our our complex we have like a a warehouse and a studio that Sarah Thungle and Night Demon kind of like operate out of. And I have an office there and it's like in the middle of these fields. So in like a kind of an industrial area, but it's kind of weird lately kind of feels like we kind of like own this orchard and like the, the road here is we're kind of just let, let people pass through, you know, like it's just really like, no, it's really desolate. It's kind of, it's a little creepy, you know, but, uh, but it's nice. It's kind of a, like a like a reset, you know. But I mean, you guys are like, who lives in LA? Like, is there less smog or what? Oh, uh, Ryan and I don't live far apart from each other in the San Fernando Valley here. And Riley, you're down where? Oceanside or Escondido? Uh, es- yeah, Escondido up in North County, San Diego. So it's uh, a nice. It's yeah, it's 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 great. I love it. It's been but same thing. It's like been totally total ghost town. Um, pretty much everywhere you go. That's not like within half a mile of a grocery store is just like totally dead, totally dead. Yeah. And I don't know how you guys feel about that, but like there's weird stuff. Like I'm like the kid in the eighties horror movie right now, like these days where like, like I'll go investigate stuff that I know I shouldn't, you know, (laughs) that's great. (laughs) That's awesome. 
like the other day we we heard like sirens out here on this like farm road like desolate road for hours so i finally had to go and there's like like a cop car like driving back and forth for hours with a siren on and on the lights on and i'm like what the hell like i mean you know your conspiracy ears automatically go up and you're like okay so the, basically they're trying to tell people that are inside by hearing that that like hey don't come outside because there's bad stuff happening out here mm. you know <laughs> but it's like people aren't that stupid right you know i mean i, I hope not G- generally speaking yeah and the other <laughs> thing is i never like i realize now like say in the past few weeks i haven't i don't think like i haven't left my house without my knife <laughs> <laughs> i just kind of like like just as a safety precaution, you know, like, I mean, obviously a knife is not going to keep me from getting sick, but you know, I go out a lot still. So I see a lot of the people that are out and like, you know, a lot of the people that are out, they're not, they're not like mentally that sane, you know? So even the people who are, I've seen like tons of, uh, people just like driving, especially like absolute, like just total outlaws, like, like panic. Ton- Oh, dude, just people like blasting through red lights and going like 40 over the speed limit in like 35 zones and shit. Just like they're just taking wow. advantage of like nobody being around and just being yeah. like, that's oh, a free for all. Like I've seen a couple races, you know, at stoplight, you know, like total yeah. like back to the future three style, you know? Yeah. And like, <laughs> and like, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely, uh, uh, interesting. You know, I thought I drive like a scion, like one of those like box scions you know the xb and uh i thought about like kind of like doomsdaying it out just a little bit like (laughs) like i wanted to get a grill on the front and maybe some like roof lights but like something kind of like inconspicuous and put like grills like around the lights and stuff like that you know just put put some bull horns up on top of it some kind of battering ram but like a legal (laughs) one you know like just like you know total zombie land style Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> I'm not opposed to that at all. Uh, my, my coworker Matt, his um, father has a collection of medieval armor, and apparently he has too much of it. So I'm going to come upon at least one medieval helmet soon, and I just have this thought and vision of, in my mind of rollerblading around the San Fernando Valley wearing a medieval helmet. I can't wait. Now seems now seems the best time to do something like that. <laughs> I feel like you need to also do it shirtless with one of those like like X shaped leather harnesses that just like right. has the big the big O ring in the middle of it. Just just go full full master full blaster. Full war, yeah. Full yeah. <laughs> That's just crazy. I mean, I'm still stuck on the fact that you have a friend that just has like, look, man, I have too much medieval armor. It's just like <laughs> it's t- it's overtaking my house, like. Uh, now that I now that I can't leave my house, like you know, I got dead cats, like a hoarder, just under medieval armor. Like, <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> it's crazy. I'm sure talk. You, I'm sure you can talk to some bands that would love some some stuff like that to use for a video or whatever. You know, well, that, that's part of it too. Is I want to have it on hand for video ideas. But yeah, well, it, it's his dad, and he's retirement age. And doesn't that seem like a Midwest dad thing to do? Is start collecting armor? Yeah, totally. It's, I, I'm 100%. not opposed to that at all. Yeah. The thing about collections though, it's like, you, you know, you need a real true collector needs all of them, you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> so, but you know, that, that's another rabbit hole. I got out of the collector world. Like when I started kind of releasing my own stuff and I collect one thing that I've, one of each of the things that I've done, you know, it's kind of been like, that's, that's, I limit it to that now, you know? Yeah. I mean, who's got the space? Yeah, well, it's crazy, yeah. dude. You know, especially especially now, you know. But um, do you know? Is there like still a metal blade warehouse of like stock or old stock or B stock or like expired license stuff or like is everything just gone or is everything at indie merch or or do you guys what do you guys ever have? Does Metal Blade ever have stuff that like later on could possibly like be unearthed like old, like new old stock? Well, that's, um, that's part of the reason that Brian started that store out in Vegas, because he did have so much old stuff. Right. Um, there's still quite a bit of really old, random 
catalog. And, you know, I think a decent chunk of things were destroyed in the 90, uh, the quake in the early 90s. What? Uh, the was Northridge destroyed. quake? Yeah, I think there really? was some, I think some Metal Blade stuff was lost in that. I'd have to double check, but that's something I remember hearing about is some things, but there's still quite a lot. Like, imagine this, there's an earthquake and like some concrete fell on a bunch of boxes of LPs and they were all crushed. You know, it's like, it's yeah, like I, I how does that get damaged in an earthquake? You know, like, yeah, I don't know. Like a fire. Well, yeah. Metal Blade was, uh, at the time, not far from the Northridge epicenter. Um, so I don't know, but I remember hearing something about that, but I'd have to look into that just to double check, but there, there's still a lot of shit and some of it's in that store in Vegas and some of it's still kind of stored away with kind of Slagle's old collection of stuff. Right. Do you, do you think, cause I know that they like when, when Warner had, was involved with the label, I know that they like Warner brothers had a big fire you know, on their property, I think, and that a lot of masters were lost and like a lot of, a lot of stuff was lost, movie backlots and, you know, all that stuff. But, um, you know, yeah, who knows? I just always like, it's always so cool to find stuff like that. And so I've seen, I've seen Brian posting some things and there, are, there is some vinyl like at that, at that, the, the swap meat store or whatever he's in, like the antique mall or whatever. That like sometimes I see I'm like oh man I want to grab that you know but I'm gonna email Brian and go hey dude can you uh yeah, hey you want <laughs> right. to mail that out to me yeah hey do you, hey what's hey Brian what's your PayPal you know like yeah just get just yeah here's my address you know hey well if if you ever see anything let us know and we can uh, we can have someone in Vegas go out there and swoop it up but oh uh, dude I'd love <laughs> yeah I'd love that let me call my Vegas guy hey yeah <laughs> it, it's it's not as shady as that sounds. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but Metal Blade does have a climate controlled master vault in Hollywood, and it looks wow. like something. It's one of those vaults uh, that companies just rent space in. It looks in like Hollywood? something. Yeah, it's one of those things. Like, you remember when they got into the underground bunker in Independence Day? It, it's oh, it, the it, movie, yeah. Yeah, it feels like that a little bit. It's really cool. It's super cold in there. You you have to wear a hoodie and gloves almost no matter what. Dude, but that is so freaking cool. Yeah, we Heather and I had to go back in there uh, months back to find an old cattle master uh, that Travis uh, from Cattle Swore existed, and we finally found it. It took some doing, but uh, Heather dug around and and found it. But uh, we took some pictures of some of these spines of the old real to real masters in there. It was pretty cool. Oh, really? Yep. Old Slayer Masters and shit. It's cool. That's that's cool, dude. That's so awesome, man. Is it like cryogenic? Is it like? <laughs> I don't I don't know how it's controlled, but yeah, you enter you enter from a, an underground parking garage, and it's all uh, passcode protected with uh, a, uh, one of those swipe card key things. And there's always a secu- there's a security guard with cameras running cameras on the parking lot, cameras on the entrance. It's pretty cool. It's crazy. You need gro- yeah. gloves and a hoodie to go inside. <laughs> yeah. One day awesome. there's going to be like, like Bill Matoyer's body's going to be frozen in there, like in a cryogenic <laughs> chamber. And he's going to waiting for the reanimation, you know, to happen, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. We have something like that for night demon and Sarah Thungle similar. I have like, it's basically, we call it the vault or they call it actually the, <laughs> the guys in the band called the jar archives, but it's, uh, it's basically a huge room that's locked and you know somewhat temperature controlled. I don't have humidifiers in there or anything, but we've got like the entire history of the bands, like all the archives are in there, master tapes too from like the seventies and stuff. So it's pretty cool. Um, so I'm I'm like I'm always like way into stuff like that. Yeah, I mean it's it's good to do it the right way, and that's something I wrestle with with my own digital master files for videos and. Uh, photos like how best to store these and it's uh you know you got to do it right otherwise it becomes too big of a mess down the road obviously digitizing stuff is the is a is like the best way to archive something for longevity but man you know you know that feeling when when you lose a hard drive or like you just (laughs) you know like all this stuff all this stuff is gone that was never really here (laughs) you know it's the strangest (laughs) feeling and it's like okay like it's not like it's like it's like losing your house and in a fire you know but like you don't remember ever living there (laughs) you know i don't know i'm just trying to use some some weird analogy about like losing all this digital information 
Yeah, that's, you know, I, I've been moving things over to Google Drive um, because you're right. Hard drives aren't a permanent storage solution. So you're into the cloud thing. Well, you you, can, you kind of have to be. Uh, for a long time, we've been juggling hard drives of video masters, and I kind of came to the realization that, especially once you have so many, it's just too cumbersome. What about um, for like personal stuff? Like, like are you? Because you're pretty techy. Would you? Would like? What's your? What's your stance? Give me the full like conspiracy theory on, on phones and cloud services. Like because I'm having major digital storage problems all the time, where it's like slowing me down. It, like. It's extremely, you know, and so like I want to join a cloud service, but like how how open or closed are those those networks? I mean, I, I've been pretty happy with Google Drive so far personally, um, but there are a bunch of different cloud services out there that probably have different levels of security. And I guess your Google Drive would be as secure as your Google account. And ultimately, that should be one of the most secure accounts you do have. Right. I mean, if your Google accounts compromised everything else could get compromised because you probably use that for a lot of other things. So I'm happy with that. I don't know, Ryan, do you use any, uh, cause Ryan, you, you still write and record and Riley, you do too. Do you guys cloud store anything? <laughs> I Google drive like almost everything. Um, but I also, I have like a, like a f- couple four terabyte Western digital. Yeah. Guys dude, that, that, that I just company, like, though, man. Oh dude, they're so rough. Dude, they, they just <laughs> stop working, you know? Yeah, they're pretty rough, but I, I only use them for, uh, usually what I do is I like, I record onto like a solid state external and then I have it on there and then I'll back it up to like a Western digital that like never gets plugged in uh, outside of when I'm backing stuff up uh. and then I'll, and then I'll back those up to the cloud so that it's like there's it's always the hard somewhere. drive like back in its original box and you're like yeah put it in the closet very carefully <laughs> put, in the put put a little sticky note on the side that has the project file name on it yeah exactly yeah and then you take it out you need it two years later and the damn thing doesn't work the, like it yeah. lights up you can yeah. hear something <laughs> spinning inside you know but no nah, just no nah, it's out of date you know it's like that that's the kind of the frustrating thing about about some of that stuff, you know, but it's, you know, I mean, well, I don't even know why I'm talking about security. Like who the hell cares? Like who wants anything from any of us? Like, (laughs) (laughs) like, like, dude, I got to I got to hack this dude's email because I need the original layout files of this so I can bootleg, uh, LP, you know, come on. (laughs) Well, you'd be surprised. We just had some emails come in over the last week or so. Uh, from someone that said they spent $95 on Bandcamp for a song. Riley, ju- this just happened with a Legion, and I forwarded it to Matt, seeing if he knew anything about it. And the email said, I, I accidentally spent $95 on a song. I meant to spend nine fifty. Can you refund this email address on PayPal? And it was different than the email address it was coming from. And I thought it was a little weird, so I asked Matt, like, hey, what's the issue with this $95 is pretty steep for one song. And he had just dealt with an email thread a week or so before with the same thing, with almost the exact same text with the same dollar amounts from a, from a different email address, but saying to refund that, uh, that same Gmail PayPal account. So Uh that's an example of potentially my guess is that Gmail account or that Bandcamp account got compromised. That's the new Uh, scam. Right, right. Like the new, and, the new. I hey, I live in Africa. Send me a check. Yep. Yeah. So, so they're yeah. So you just don't know what kind of scheme scammers might come up with. So you got to be even if you have nothing to hide. You, you you're attached to so many billing things online. You need to be careful. Can you imagine how many applications are going to be scams right now? Like oh, digital yeah. hackers are going to be like, hey, free money from the government, you know, or COVID nineteen right. relief. Like all you need to do is create some little generic logo and then go give me all of your info here and apply. I right. want your social security number. I want your mother's maiden name. I want you to create passwords. I want you to like, <laughs> you know, just give like all that data, you know? So I'm sure there's going to be, you know, Hey, whatever. That's the way the world is. That's the way the world is, you know? Yeah. It's crazy. I'm sure a Legion has a song about how screwed up everything is. Oh, so, so many, so (laughs) 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 many. Well, man, I even actually working on us. We are, we're, we're doing a song right now about like this whole thing that's going on. You know, we started writing it 
before things got really crazy too. So we're like, okay, we got to stick with it now. I'm sure many people will be touching on this as things are progressing. I'm sure it's happening right now. There's probably books and movies being written and tons of songs and, you know, like, I mean, that's gotta be happening, right? I, I'm personally working on, uh, cause I'm doing lots of like, uh, lots of like session work and lots of studio jobs uh, from home right now. And I am personally working on three songs uh, from different bands around the world that are like, so we're doing like a COVID-19 song. It's all about like the apocalypse and shit. And I'm like, all right, word. I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll whip up some lyrics and try to make them different from the other two songs that I'm writing about this. <laughs> <laughs> so they're all your projects? No. So I usually like r- will write lyrics though for studio things. Cause it's kind of like, People want like my vocal style, but they also want like my writing style. Really? Um, yeah. You so you pen lyrics for other artists? Yeah, for sure. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. So I mean, just for my parts, you know what I mean. But you know, if if they're like, oh, we oh, we want you on a whole song, then all of a sudden I'm writing lyrics and doing vocals for a for a whole song as like a guest feature kind of thing. See, that's cool, uh, man. That's lucrative in times like these, you know? Yeah, absolutely. It's been it's been saving my ass for sure. Yeah, like I've been able, it's crazy. Like I've been able to hire probably seven or eight people that like I've always tried to work with, but we're always so busy, you know, whether I'm talking about like producers, artists, um, publicists, uh, um, like live or or, uh, video, video guys, you know? So it's like all these guys that now are like, not doing anything looking for something to do and especially if you can a lot of that if you could do remotely is great you know if you're editing videos or or mixing audio or you know stuff like that i mean it's it's definitely something that can be done or you're you're an artist and you're painting or you're drawing or, or whatever you know but yeah so that that's been that's been really gratifying for us to be able to be like hey look we're able to give some we're able to give people some work and we're able to work with the people that we want to work with so it's been really it's been really cool for the creative process you know especially not like kind of like i don't know if you've had uh, any tours or festivals rescheduled we've had some rescheduled but yeah we have one thing we have one thing in august that's still on the books that hasn't been postponed or anything and i'm like he's skeptical i'm skeptical that that's gonna stay a thing but we'll we'll see yeah like like for midnight we announced a tour yesterday like the european tour that we already had booked and routed for october and november I've been working on that since l- last year. So, um, but I was like, yeah, you know what? We had it scheduled to announce this time. Let's just do it because the worst is like, it's like when you get like, if you have one fest- big festival cancel in August, then everybody else in the world's pretty much uh, like, all right, August is done. You know, if these guys aren't doing it, then nobody's, nobody's going to do anything, you know? Yeah. So you need to have people start announcing things for later on and going like, Hey, plan for this because this is going to happen and we're going to get through this thing by then, you know? (laughs) So, um, I don't know. I'm trying to be optimistic and not paranoid about it. I don't, I don't really know how you guys feel about it, but like, it's a, it's a light at the end of the tunnel tour. That's what that is. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. All right. That's pretty, that's pretty good. You know, I mean, I don't know. I like you guys like, I like that you're scared. I like that you're coming at it from trying to look at the bright side. I mean, I think that's really important. I think a lot of people are like, you know, doom and gloom right now and the world is over. Yeah. Well, let me give you this. let, Let me give you this stat. Okay. This is not like a, actually, it's not a real stat, but like, like I don't have actual numbers, but like, like during the Great Depression, like the big crash of 29, you know, like Mm -hmm. that was like, the time that there were more millionaires made in America, like per capita, like than a- any other time in history, you know, like there was a lot of, like we hear about a lot of these, these big downturns and like these big catastrophic events that happen. But if you look at history, they happen over and over again. Like it's just repeating history, repeating itself. Like, like the saying goes, you know, mm-hmm. and like, there's always a, a better way to look at things. And like, you just got to search, you got to look deeper, in and and 
you know, really tap into that and find that. And everybody's going to find something different, you know, which is unique to them, which is really cool, you know, but it's like having the scarcity mindset. You don't think that there's enough in everybody. When you have the scarcity mindset, it's kind of like everything in the world, like there's not enough to go around right now, you know, and like I'm at the bottom of the food chain, so I'm not going to be successful or I'm not going to. I don't have anything or, you know, there's no opportunity for me basically, you know, but that's totally not true. Cause like these days you have eight year olds on YouTube making like $24 million a year, like showing their toys, you know? <laughs> so like there's tons, there's tons of opportunity out there. You just kind of gotta like, you know, you gotta look inside, you gotta, you gotta search deep within yourself to find that. And now the world's making you do it. It's making you, the world has made everybody take vacation, you know? And isolate themselves and chill out by themselves. So, like, what better time, right? Would totally, you agree? Totally. Yeah, and and that's you know one of the things I've always found fascinating about you specifically, Jarvis, is you've really made this cottage industry with traditional metal happen in the U.S. Uh, you're uh, Sierra Thungle's releasing the first new record, Forever Black, uh, in April this month. It's their first new record in how many years? Twenty nine. Yeah, and yeah. It, did did you're the young guy, you know, a guy that's not even that young, but compared to the rest of the band, did they think it was possible for them to even come back and do a record? Did they even think anybody cared? You Originally? know, it's weird. Like I think initially before the, before the band reunited, I think that they, they did not care, but it's funny because as things started to progress and the band had like all the success right off the bat and like a whole new, like 85% of the current fans are like a whole generation younger or two you know and like you know like like young hot chicks are like way into the band and these dudes are like in their 60s and i'm like oh, what the hell's going on here you know and like these, it's just like like this is this little like i don't want this to come across as creep these dudes is like creepy grandpa you know <laughs> like right at that point it was like they wanted to make a record really bad. And I was actually the one to put it off. I put it off for a couple of years, you know, because I mean, we all know what happens when old guys get back together after 25, 30 years and try and make new music that never goes well. You know, it's hard. It's usually, they want to be, you know, hip and current and like modern and be able to like, stand up like to today's standards but like and relate to their younger audience but what a lot of bands don't realize is like their audience wants them for them you know they want them to be in their 60s and they want them to do their thing you know they want them to be themselves they don't need them to have like current fashion or or <laughs> you know or like write modern type music you know but a lot of people don't understand that so you know thankfully for me as the manager like i'm kind of the last stop so nothing's going to get done by this band. They're not going to play publicly or release anything publicly unless it's good, you know, because the band doesn't need to do anything at this point, you know? So my job is basically to protect the legacy of the band. That's kind of how I look at it. That's smart. So yeah, the songs actually came out pretty good, but again, it's like, I'd be on tour with night demon for like, you know, six months or something. And like, <laughs> they would be here at, at home writing the music and then send me demos and stuff. And I would come home and uh, I have two subs. Like I have a bass player that, that normally subs for me. So the guys can rehearse a few times a week and I have a backup for him if he can't make it. So the bases are covered there, you know, but you know, I think those guys would get frustrated cause I would come home and they'd be working hard on something for months and I would chop it up and be like, yeah, that sounds like corn right there or something that is not happening. You know, and they'd be like, what? Like, you know, no, sorry. You know, yeah. so it's like there was it, it was a good like tug of war, you know, process through the whole thing. But it ended up being really good. And us having access to our own studio and like the Armand from Night Demon producing the record and engineering it, it just made it really relaxed. You know, we were very comfortable and it was it was, it was good because that's the band never ever had that in their career they were always rushed for time and out of money and that's why those records sound like crap you know so it was a good thing and you know the songs did turn out well in the end and and you know it's definitely a worthy ungle record so i'm happy about that you know it's a it's a good comeback for them and 
I just, it's just not something I ever counted on, you know, like it's not something I ever wanted to push them to do because, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we all know that, you know, that's the, that's the, uh, you know, 90% of the time, that's what you get when you have guys that come back after so long. I mean, these guys, they didn't even play in other bands, <laughs> you know, like they, when they, they broke up, you know, they spent 25 years, like not playing at all, like not pl owning an instrument, you know? So that was like a part of their past that they were like put away in a box, you know? So anyway, I digress. Uh, no, that, somebody that's, else talk. That, that, that's <laughs> no, that, that's all super fascinating. Cause it's, we put out to fans, these bios that I, I think are usually really cool. And there's always so much more info to uncover especially with a band like Sirith Uncle that does have such a long history. And that is crazy to just put away and not think about playing an instrument after having been in a band that was active uh, for at least an amount of time. That's I, I didn't, I don't even think I really realized that they, they didn't play at all. No, not at all. Like it was a, no, it was totally like even Rob Garvin, he sold his drum set in like 92 and sw he swore that he would never touch a pair of drumsticks again. Wow. And like 11 years after that, his wife got him a pair of drumsticks, like as a stocking stuffer. That's funny. He refused to touch them even then. And he made her like, he wouldn't touch them. And so she put them away up in the closet. And when I got the, when I convinced him to try and play drums again, it was in 2015. He grabbed those sticks. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. That's I was like, it's, <laughs> I always wanted like, it's the, the, the ship has sailed on making a movie about this band. Cause I think the time that to do, to film that would have been as the, you know, as these guys were learning how to play again and getting reintroduced to each other after decades of bad blood and not talking to each other, you know, but, uh, cause you know, like night demons pretty tight with the guys in Anvil. Like we've spent, we've done a lot of shows with those guys. And so we've seen their dynamic firsthand. And obviously we all know about their movie. Sure. <laughs> Sir Thungle has a, like a crazier, story and even like there's a lot of tragedy behind it too you know there's deaths and all kinds of stuff like it's i i'm kind of living that movie you know uh but it would it i always thought it would be interesting for people to see you know because there's such these guys in the band they're just such characters and they're so you know the music is just so weird itself you know so uh you know but that's why i like podcasts and i like things like this because like you said, Vince, like when, you know, you get the bios, they, it's like, you know, we've got super long bios, but nobody wants that. You know, nobody has the patience anymore in, to read a long bio. They're used to scrolling through social media feeds at lightning speed, you know? Sure. Um, as, but, but that's why I like, I, I, I like that podcasts like as a medium have taken off because uh, it's not a new form of media, but it's definitely had its years of like, it, it was a slow build, you know? I think it's good now because I think it it um, especially when they're archived. I think it kind of like supplies the future. Um, I think podcasts are like the future bibliography. I guess I would say for writers or for people trying to compile information and get put a story together, you know, or write books, you know, because it's so hard. To, like you know, you just have to go go to the library and like look at those like slides and look through newspapers and hope to find something somewhere, you know. Then you had Google, but like, you know, a lot of this stuff is like reading through interviews online or just finding them or tracking down magazines, you know, but now I think on podcasts, like people are, they have more freedom and more, more, ex more time to express themselves like authentically that you get kind of, you get, you get a lot more information. I don't know if you guys would agree with any of that. No, totally. And I, I've definitely turned on podcasts a lot more in the last couple of years. And, you know, one of the things we've been discussing at length on this podcast on a couple of the episodes, I at least want to bring up a little bit. And you touched on it earlier with just musicians having to go out there and grab that. And I've been banging the drum for things like Twitch and Patreon for a long time. Allegiant has a Patreon. And as you said, as long as musicians are providing something for fans. Yeah, you have to so give a service. Yeah, what what yeah. what do you recommend specifically? Like creators and bands should do that you're doing that you're finding really works. Come up with your own ideas and don't take mine. That's my. <laughs> I think about it all the damn time, and I got a list, and it's a running list. 
And when I, when I try something and it doesn't work, I just go to that next thing. No, but in all seriousness, I, I hate to be like a crystal Twinkie. You know, I like to be the evil metal guy. But honestly, it's not a bad idea to just, when you have this time in seclusion, to just sit there and just, you know, close your eyes and think about things, you know, <laughs> or just start writing things down. Just, I, just ask yourself some questions, you know. That's the best thing to do in a band too. You know, whenever I have meetings with the band, I'm always like, like have a list of questions. Let's ask ourselves some honest questions here. You know, let's assess ourselves. Like as if we're looking in on what we're doing, you know, like what would a fan want from us? Exactly. Yeah. That's the best thing to do because the cool thing about metal is that it's, it's all fan driven. There's nothing commercial about it that, that ever transfers over to us monetarily to the bands or the labels. It's always anytime money is made these days, it's for, it's all fan driven. You know, we got to, th we have to thank the fans for that. Um, there's not a bunch of big sponsorships anymore or, or like just major label dough just to try things out, you know? So, <laughs> um, uh, I think that, the cool thing about metal is there's so many subgenres, and there's subgenres of subgenres. There's just things that, like, everything has its own audience, and it's just crazy to see how there's like a there's a style of metal that you don't even know about that has a huge audience, you know. And I think that you just have to serve your audience first. And once you can do that, then your story organically grows and you can potentially gain some new fans, you know, but I don't think the motivation should be the money. I think, right. Yeah. I think the thing is you have to look at it and go, look, Hey, we have a unique opportunity right now to do something unique and to, and, and uh, with the current cards that we've been dealt, what's something that's cool that our fans will dig. And if you put enough work behind it and you have enough quality behind it, then you could probably charge some money for it and people would, would have no problem spending the money to support you if you're giving them something, you know, if you know the, the, then there's the flip side of it where it's like a lot of other people are just kind of doing it for free, you know, where it's like, but that, that band may be just going like, Hey, here's, we're going on Facebook live from our practice space on my iPhone and the speakers all blown out and shit. And like, you know, there's just a certain level. If, if, it's that's kind of like whatever level of quality you're going to give out is is what you can charge for it, you know this is in this day and age and the way that the world is changing people are going to be paid what they're worth that's just how it's going to be you know and if you want to make more money <laughs> with this society that's coming then you just got to do higher quality stuff you know yeah and, and and i'm glad i'm glad you brought that up about uh fan service because a lot of the meetings at metal blade and you've been in meetings at metal blade before jarvis when we're talking about a new product or a new pre-order item uh the first part of the conversation is really is it cool and do we think fans would like it and then we figure out financially if it makes sense that's that's really where it all starts because it has to it does and i've recently been through that with what with our last campaign where we just dropped that night even single out of the sky but you know, in an instant grad society and where future is unknown, you know, and fearful, like it, it, it actually benefited us to have to, do, to have done it that way, you know? So, um, I'm all yeah. about the experimentation, you know? It, yeah. Right now is a, a good time to be flexible. Uh, and sorry to cut you off, Jarvis. I just wanted to ask Riley. So, so Riley, you just, you guys just dropped roundabout. Yes, cover yep. kind of out of nowhere as a sort of surprise. Some people knew, uh, Patreon followers of a Legion knew. Yeah. Um, but what have you found the response to be so far? Um, the response has been mostly positive, but it's, you know, it's like Jarvis was saying, like, you have to put in that work. Like we have to, you know, we're trying to do as many follow up things that we can so that it doesn't just like die on the vine. You know what I mean? Like the whole point of releasing something like this is to build momentum and uh you know originally it was planned to be like a pre-tour momentum builder because tours you know are obviously the best way to build that you know get that speed going up um but now we're in a position where it's like we have to really think about ways to uh you know break out of the box and continue to build momentum uh around this track that will ultimately help the band uh and 
you know, that's been the biggest challenge of it. Cause we, you know, the music we feel, you know, stands on its own. Like it's, it was, it was, it's already a good song. You know what I mean? It's already a cover that people are very familiar with. Um, and then, you know, we're, we're confident that our fan base uh, and even people outside of our fan base that are into similar things are going to hear, you know, what we do and, and be into it or, you know, not into it because it's music uh, and all that, all that shit's subjective. But, you know, we're pretty confident that the music will stand on its own in that element uh, of things. But, you know, the follow up has been the hardest part. And we've done, you know, like a live stream event uh, that I just did on like Facebook Live, uh, like answering Q&A kind of stuff and trying to organize some kind of like live streaming event. But uh, also, as Jarvis said, it's like it's tough because that's what everyone is doing right now. So thinking outside the box of people who are thinking outside the box right now is like the biggest challenge uh, of this whole this whole thing it can be done and that's and it will be done and it, oh, yeah. are you going to be the guy to do it i mean that's the thing and that's yep. the way i think you know it's like it will be done somebody's going to do something and i want i want to be that guy you know and it's you just really you've really got to focus on it and i'm telling you the positivity angle helps a lot you just got to have faith and you got to know that if you're if you're willing to 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 put the work in that you're gonna something's gonna come out of it most of it's just showing up you know sometimes people plan so much and they never really show up you know yeah yeah that's that yeah that's one of the problems i've found is i've had artists reach out to me with streaming ideas that were just far too elaborate and i say look you you gotta learn to to crawl before you sprint here if you're going to dive into the streaming realms um it's yeah there there's some learning curves there for making a quality stream Uh, and yeah it's i sometimes i think people come up with complicated ideas so they never have to follow through that's just my negative side yeah the creativity (laughs) flows you know how it is when the creativity flows and then you start getting ideas then you start talking to other people then stuff really sprouts and develops into something you know, sometimes it's like, sometimes you have to just get it. You have to do the basics and get it out there and, and be consistent about it versus, you know, if you're a total perfectionist, which I've been before, like it never gets done and it never gets done like to your liking. You know, if, if you have the habit of just producing content and getting it out regularly, like, you know, okay, so you said you have a Patreon, right? So you yeah. can't just do, like, one badass thing once every six months on that, right? I mean, it's a subscription, right? Right. So explain, um, if you can, like, what, how you guys use it and what you guys, how, how it works with your band. So it has honestly, like, really slowed down over the past, uh, you know, six months to a year or so. Um, okay, so, so you've had it for a while then. Yeah, we've had it since 2016. Um, wow. and when, and when we were right out the gate with it, we got like tons of shit uh, that we t- spoke about earlier in this podcast, uh, but tons of shit from the metal industry, uh, before this kind of thing was like normalized. Oh, um, like giving you a hard time about it. Oh uh, yeah. Dude being like, oh, this band is just asking for handouts and they well, should like work if they want to get. Yeah, basically. Um, which is, you know, uh, again, something we talked about earlier in this podcast about how it's, you know, very fan club driven, but, um, when we first started out, that's basically how we treated it was it's like, you know, here's all this, you know, uh, yeah, here's all this viral content, you know, here's exclusive video music videos, here's some playthroughs. Uh, you know, we had, uh, some, some grand ideas, uh, about like exclusive streams and like, uh, video lessons and stuff that never really came to fruition. Uh, but like the ideas were there, you know what I mean? Um, you know, thinking about how, yeah, it it really is. And for $3 a month, yeah and and being uh you know as far apart as my band is um you know two of us living on opposite sides of california uh two of us live in colorado and then one of us lives in illinois so it's like really difficult it's like herding cats being like hey here's the content schedule like this is what you need to generate so that like we can keep these people that are subscribed to this thing happy yeah it's 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 tough so like i said it's it's slowed down a lot over the past uh like six months to a year so just because we've had to focus on you know, touring and album releases and all this kind of stuff. But like, so, so you see, so you generated less content and you saw fans drop off from it basically. Uh, Oh yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, and that's just kind of the name of the game. Do you feel like those fans are gone or do you feel like those fans? Oh no, 
Not at all. I think that no one no one ever really feels like jilted by the whole like, well, I signed up for this Patreon thing and it didn't give me what I was expecting. Um, I mean, that will happen eventually just because that's how some people's personalities are. But I think most people see, I think that's what makes me nervous to do it. It's like I never want like I never want to take that step back where it's like like this guy's such a loyal fan for years, you know, like seen us you know 15 times like like come to our first tour comes to see us every time owns all the shirts owns all the records and then like one day he just like <laughs> he i'm sorry i can't give you my three dollars a month anymore see but i i feel like the, the those guys those guys who are like super dedicated and super you know been there since the beginning kind of people oftentimes they'll just let their subscription run just because they want to like support the band like they don't really care if they get anything in return um, and that's, that's obviously not to say like, you shouldn't be giving them something in return, but again, I, yeah, I think that's gotta be the main focus. Like you gotta have as a band, I think you gotta have that integrity a little bit intact yeah. where it's like, look, like we're willing to weather the storm here, you know, but it's kind of like, again, like we're, we live in a society now where it's completely about survival and, what people actually need you know oh yeah so you know my job with my with the with what i'm playing performing and with what you know the the other bands that i'm you know involved with their career is just kind of be like we have to make it that good you know that somebody would like would 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 have this over going out to to dinner tomorrow night you know what i'm saying (laughs) you know so or uh that's kind of like the it's the reality that we're that we're that we're living in and that we're facing because you know things have not hit quite yet you know like things 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 are definitely definitely going to change and i'm wondering if there's even going to be more manufacturing like in america you know i'm kind of hoping that it goes that way because i mean there's the other side of it too where a lot of factory workers are probably going to like lose their jobs you know or you know who knows like warehouse people you just don't you just don't know everything's moving into automation and all this kind of crazy stuff you know and i'm sure there'll be people working in warehouses but eventually they're going to be like really highly paid people that know what they're doing and there'll be less of them you know what i'm saying yeah yeah, yeah the the future i think especially if you're going to be an independent creator in any capacity whether it's music because look, ultimately, uh, us and a lot of our peers are independent creators that do music as an expensive hobby, break even, or make a little bit of money. Are most of us? Uh, we're the lucky ones that get to work at a label and, and get a regular paycheck. But we realize we're in a better position than most, and that's really kind of a crazy pri- privileged position. But for entertainment as a whole, it's really going to be a function of those who will and those who won't. It's not a function of can'ts. It's it's will or won't. I think so too. But also from a business standpoint, I mean, I think you still have to look at financially like, Hey, what's going to move the needle here and what's going to rock the boat? Like what do people, what makes what we do essential to people's lives? You know, are we providing them with a service that's changing their lives? You know, and with the label, it's kind of tricky because it's like, I would think right now, like, huh, I would probably not put my focus in manufacturing like reissue picture disc or box set or whatever, you know what I'm saying? Versus generating some new content that's relative to what's happening now and what people need now, you know, that's exciting um, that people are going to want to buy because it's kind of the thing. It's like, like you want to own all these, you know, people out there, like, especially metalheads, they, they love their collections and they're meticulous about their, them. And some people are materialistic about them, but it's like, you can't, you're not going to buy a, you know, and the, a, you're not going to buy the entire Iron Maiden discography at once on reissue picture disc vinyl, like right now, you know, like you're just going to listen to it on Spotify and, pre- <laughs> you know, right. Yeah, it's no one's really sure what's going to happen yet. And a lot of the things I think that are still coming out or coming out right now from labels are, like you said before, things that were done just in time before this all happened. So things are still coming out, but it's because they were already done. 
And beyond that, there's a hell of a lot of uncertainty still there. Yeah. We just don't know yet, and we'll see in three months. I honestly think that, like, see, honestly, okay, so I don't know. I I don't watch the news or anything because it's just too, it's too negative for me, you know? So I don't know how real this thing is or not. Like, me living my life, like, I'm not affected by it you quite yet like in a, in a negative way you know I've, I've mentioned all the positive things that have happened um but you know i still think that even if this thing is like a a really big deal and a really big problem and a potential huge threat i still seem to think that a lot of americans are still just gonna waste their money on crap after this <laughs> you know i really do i really do you know but there's nothing like the the fan to band connection. When you have that, you're always going to be okay. Like your fans will always take care of you if you if you, if you need them and you can provide them with something that's really awesome, you know? So that's always a that's always a really good thing to have, to have that connection. You know, if you had to rely, if it was like the old days where you just had to, where like a label just had physical distributors and that was it. And then if we were going through this, a band would have to rely purely on album sales because they can't tour, but the record stores are closed. Then everybody would be screwed, you know? So that's one, I guess, positive thing of, you know, the, the modern age, right? We have the ability to do, to do things like that. So. Yeah. And, and look, we just plowed through just about an hour in conversation yeah, sorry about that. Um, and, I was mostly no, it, just it, rambling. And this is great. It, it's why podcasts are, are fantastic and why um, we can dive deep into these things. We don't have to worry about time limits or any of that. But no, wh- what you said is exactly right. And that's why I bang on the drum so hard for artists to explore outlets and platforms like Patreon, like Twitch. Not only because it's a potential source of revenue for the artist, but ultimately because it's a cool fan experience. And fans uh, want to talk to their favorite artists no matter how big they might be in the scope of whatever subgenre they're in. Fans just like that experience, and it, every band right now should be trying to experiment with ways that they can do that on their terms. I've seen a lot of people sign up for that video thing. What's that one? Like celebrities, like, well... Cameo. Cameo, yeah, where it's like you go on there and you're like, hey, I want, um, you know, Urkel. And then they're like, okay, well, Urkel's like... 400 bucks like per video and it's 20 seconds or whatever you can write the script you know and then but like everybody has their own price like some people are pretty damn expensive you know yeah so i could only afford the urkel one but all right you know uh, hard times dude <laughs> you know but i i i still bet you know people are gonna spend their money on, on stuff like that so <laughs> yeah <laughs> Well, yeah, this was fantastic, and you know you're a busy you're a busy guy, and so really thank you for taking the time. And yeah, R- Ryan Riley, you, you have any last minute uh, tidbits to throw out there for Jarvis before we wrap this up? No, that was great. Just thanks for your perspective and your time. That was awesome, man. Lots of lots of good uh good good perspectives that I hadn't necessarily uh, thought of came from this conversation. So thank you for that. That's good to hear. That's what I always want. You know, I mean that's uh we can like have an open dialogue and take something from it. You know I mean? I think that's, that's super important. Absolutely. I'm trying to become a better listener these days, even though I talk so much, but, uh, but you know, like that, I think that's always good. You know, I used to be a guy who, when, when I had an agenda, if I'm having a conversation with somebody, I'm already thinking about what the next thing I'm going to say when they're right. And you know, every, every, everything they're saying to me is, is like just white noise, you know, kind of, gotten better at that through the years and definitely <laughs> like spending spending some time alone talking to yourself yeah you get better at that. <laughs> <laughs> that that is absolutely a learned skill and i you know i think everybody needs to practice at that a little bit uh and i would include myself in that group but uh, before we wrap you up here where should people look to find you and your bands online what's the easiest thing to do so I don't have a website. I kind of like, I guess I would say I have a boutique company, you know, I'm not sure. like, looking for, I'm never looking for clients. Oddly enough, I would say the best place to go is uh, King's road is the merchandise site. Um, and where you'll find um, night demon, Sirith Ungle, Visigoth, Satan and midnight. All of the stuff is there. And 
actually when when we started doing business with the company i i actually convinced them to update their platform a little bit and i added tour dates and an instagram feed onto those merch pages so like that's kind of the official site for some of the bands so you you got all the information that you need there you know you have the news feed that's updated daily on social media and like the bands in town app is right there so you can see where the bands are playing but 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 there's nothing scheduled so you don't need to go there uh, well, to, to that section but you can you can go and check out the merch and, and all that stuff so yeah ultimately what what else does a band need in a website outside of an instagram feed tour dates and merchandise so check out king king's road for all the bands that jarvis manages there yeah, you go. Midnight, Visigoth, Sirithungal, Satan, and Night Demon. Pretty gnarly gang. It's a it's <laughs> I'm right. satisfied with these with with the crop here and like you know, we've we've everybody's friends and it's a cool it's a cool vibe that with under the umbrella that that I that I work under, you know, it kind of reminds me of it's like an old school label in a bit. Like there's a real big camaraderie in the bands that are they're kind of, you know, that are in that in the same scene but they're each different enough and they do their own thing well enough you know so that's it thank you guys fantastic it's been a pleasure man all right talk to you guys later thank you see ya see ya and we're back hope you all enjoyed that chat with jarvis leatherby really appreciate him taking the time to uh give us the business man totally oh yeah video games so video games obviously during a situation like a global damn pandemic people are at home playing video games because you can only work out so much and i'm working out somehow less so i've been playing more <laughs> video games what, what are you guys playing uh dude so much stuff uh but i will uh, you know i feel like my my video game section is gonna be kind of long so ryan what are what are you playing you know i kind of I kind of got away from first person shooters for a long time you know i used to play counter-strike back in the day like 2001 uh, like on dial up with 150 ping and still, oh, yeah. and still somehow doing well. And so I was like really into that era of games and I really kind of got out of it because it's got like, got so twitchy and so kind of toxic and I played overwatch for a while. I really like that, but in general, I, I haven't been super deep into first person shooters, but that being said, the new call of duty, modern warfare, I think is actually really good. Um, even though, you know, it's got some problems with the servers and ping and stuff like that, the net code, but the new Warzone mode, honestly, being a fan of PUBG, I think that they did the best job with a battle Royal so far. Um, it's really polished. It's really smooth. It's really fun. It's teams of threes or solos and just having that style of game, but with like the AAA studio polish on it. And all of the kind of things that they've added, like the uh, the gulag and all of the different drops and all the different vehicles and stuff, like I'm having a lot of fun with that. So I'm actually putting a ton of time into um, just the quick play mode to try to like level up my guns and get my different loadouts and do all that. So I'm I'm fully back hooked into first person shooters and being that annoying kind of person that plays those. And I'm, so how I'm loving it. How is that compared to the to the Black Ops? Because I remember when Black Ops launched, we played a couple rounds of like the Battle Royale version of it. And it was it was OK. Yeah, you know, I, I liked I liked Blackout. I thought it was fun. I thought it was um, OK, but there's there was just something about it where to me, the guns didn't translate to that big map. And I don't right. I don't know what it was. I don't know if Infinity Ward just has the special sauce, but the guns just feel so much better to me in, in the new Modern Warfare. And and I don't know, I don't know what to attribute that to, but maybe it's just because I spent more time and just got into it. But it to me, it feels way better than that last thing did the blackout. I think I think it definitely does feel way better than blackout. Yeah. So um, and then also I've been watching my uh, girlfriend play Animal Crossing, and then I kind of got sucked into making my own character in that too. And like, dude, I love casual games. Like um Oh God! What's the other one? That's uh, Stardew Valley. Stardew Valley. Like I love games like that. It's like relaxing. You have some building elements. There's like some cutesy bullshit. It's all great. So I'm like, oh, okay, Animal Crossing. I've never played one before. I'm like, oh, this will be cool. I started playing it, and the the main guy like that you talk to, Tom Nuke or whatever his name is, is like, oh, uh, 
welcome to the island. You're indebted to me a hundred thousand dollars or bells or whatever it is. And I'm just like, I just got here. How am I already in debt? Like this makes no sense. There's this thing called, I heard it referred to as the Nintendo second where like every piece of dialogue kind of like takes up these extra two or three seconds that it seems like it doesn't really need to. And it kind of right. like it, they don't respect your time. Like it really, no. it really wants you to like be stuck on this game all day long. And it gives you all these little tasks and it's a cool game. I'm just kind of shitting on it to be funny right now, but I think it does really like not respect your time. And they so, want, yeah, go ahead. You know, what's really funny about that. Uh, go ahead, Vince. I was just going to say the best take I've found on Tom Nook on Twitter was that you're not going to find a better deal than a zero interest home loan that you can pay back at your leisure. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so ultimately he's kind of the ultimate, you know, the ultimate dude. He didn't have to do that. Hey, you want a, You want a house? Just pay me back when you can. I don't care. I feel like he organizes <laughs> Firefest in his spare time. But it's also, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're also moving to an island with a strange dude. It's kind of got a cult vibe to it a little bit. He's like, yeah, just build up all this stuff and uh, it'll be great. You do all the work and uh, yeah, I'm just <laughs> I'm just here for the loans, man. Yeah, exactly. So I, I haven't played Animal Crossing yet. I, ha- I have a Switch. I haven't picked it up yet because I've been playing tons of other stuff that I'll get into in a minute. But uh, when it... I've never played an Animal Crossing game. This is what, like the fourth or fifth installment of yeah, the series. It's been too. around for a while, um, but I've never played one. And I saw a, a, a repost of a tweet that someone made uh, where they said, I, I recently asked three of my friends, like what you do in Animal Crossing <laughs> and all and all three of them replied with literally just vibing, bro. And I'm like, what does that mean? Like, what? Like, are you playing video games in the video game? Like, what are you? What's the? What are you doing in this game? And uh, our our colleague uh, uh, Nikki Law uh, at Metal Blade uh, asked me what I was playing a few days ago when we were organizing some press stuff, and she tried to explain it to me. And at the end of her explanation, she was like, you know, this all sounds really stupid now that I'm like putting it into, into words. And uh, <laughs> and I think that that's probably the only reason that I haven't played it yet is that I'm just like, I don't know what like I, someone on my Facebook, like just earlier today posted like a scene. <laughs> A scene of like the credits rolling and i was like you can beat that game like there's there's an, a start and a finish like i didn't even know that like yeah, so no I, it's, I just started uh, playing it. yeah. it's basically island decorating simulator you know you have your house you, you can build different things you you mine a lot of resources and that gets you money to build more things and you can do like custom things where you make your own patterns and there actually is a lot of creativity in it and you know i think we have an overabundance of games where you fucking shoot people in the face or you chop their heads off. And I love all those games too, but I like that there's other games that are just about being creative and aren't about fighting and killing all the time. I think we have like way too many of those. So I, in that way, it's absolutely cool. agree. It's the reason why Minecraft and Stardew Valley rule, right? Totally. Yeah. Uh, and the closest thing to uh, Animal Crossing that I could think of is Stardew Valley. It's really, it's a cartoony Nintendo version of that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, Stardew Valley is basically like a like a reskin of a uh, Harvest Moon. I think Harvest right. Moon right. was like the first like, hey, you guys want to just like <laughs> you guys just vibing. You want to just hang out in a video game, just vibe together, just fucking build your farm, man. Like, I mean, whatever. Do you harvest your crops? It's cool. Do it at your own pace. Don't worry about it. Like it's a it's a good stress reliever. I can definitely see that, which is funny because that's kind of why I play video games. Totally. Um, to like unwind and relax and like i like a challenge here and there like sometimes i'll play games to to kind of you know like test my skills and all that kind of stuff but sure i'm i mostly just play video games to like check out and like unwind for a few hours well dude um especially right now we're all stuck inside yeah. we, we can't hang out with our friends i know a lot of times uh me and my friends will get on discord to like play a game and we end up just chatting in discord and we don't really even want to play the game after a while and this is like those type of games where you can actually just kind of virtually hang out with other people. Um, not that there's like a, a, a voice chat function in Stardew Valley, but any kind of game where, uh, you know, you can just kind of go and chill and do like, you know, basic kind of things with your friends. I think especially right now is is cool, you know? Oh, yeah. I've been seeing tons of Facebook posts being like, 
who has roses on their island and i'm just like what are you guys talking about but then i'll see like 30 replies being like dude i got white yellow red what do you need bro and i'm like i'm like what is happening (laughs) that's awesome (laughs) yep but i love it it's it's great well i've been playing some uh some pretty some pretty sweaty uh games uh speaking of animal crossing and how not sweaty it is uh i picked up doom the same day that it came out cool. Uh, actually, the day before, because in the light of this uh, pandemic stuff, when GameStop still had their doors open, uh, to avoid having like a a double midnight release, like you know, one like for Animal Crossing and Doom the same night, they actually were selling Doom the day before. Oh wow. uh, Street street date. Um. So I picked that up the day before it, uh, it was supposed to come out. Played it on stream for a little while, and it was super fun. And then I played it. A little bit more on my own time and that game is so intense like and i i get it because it's you know it's doom and it's supposed to be intense and it's just like you know you know high adrenaline 100 miles an hour just right you know kill 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 uh but like after having played 2016 uh quite extensively going into eternal I was like, oh my God, I love this so much. The Doom Fortress, it's so cool. Look at all this fan service. And mm-hmm. it's like super intense, but it's also kind of like goofy. And it's it's such a nice twist for Doom. I love it. And then I started progressing through the story. And uh, I still haven't beaten it uh, because of, for, for the reason that I feel could best be explained in this text that I got from a friend of mine who he hit me up and he was like, dude, I just beat Doom. And I was like, oh yeah, how was it? And he was like, bro, that last level, I feel... I feel like I just walked away from a car accident and I was just like, that <laughs> That sounds terrible. That sounds Stressful. like the opposite of what I want for my gaming experience. So right. I, uh, I I hit a couple levels where I was just like, you know, replaying it over and over and over. For those of you who haven't played it, the way that the battle system in that game works, like it's, it's part like platformer, like first person platformer, uh, you know, like like map exploration like there's tons of you know collectibles and it's got some rpg elements and the way that you like level up your character but the actual battle parts of that game are all kind of like wave based arena okay uh cut type of setups like if you've ever played a serious sam game sure it's kind of like a much more polished version of that it's like as soon as you think you're done like Guess what? Here's the 30 more enemies and they're uh, all the hardest kind of the wave that you just fought and it's like, "Oh my god." And it's it is so sweaty. It is like super sweaty. Yeah. Uh dude, I just like I'm like white knuckling my controller playing that game just like, "Oh my god." It's it's but it's really fun. And if, you know, the whole like adrenaline from gaming thing is is your you know, is is your cup of tea, then Doom is amazing. Well, uh but I've I've also been playing Borderlands to kind of counteract that whole super sweaty first person shooter thing yeah i was gonna say like having a game like animal crossing come out at the same time as that as that is almost kind of perfect because you oh, yeah. you want to go to something completely non-stressful after you're like white knuckling all these levels so did you did yeah. you guys see all the crossover memes all the oh yeah yeah the, oh yeah the it's doom great. slayer and isabel hanging out it's hilarious it's amazing I, I still have to beat doom 2016 i'm stuck on an early level because i can't find a damn blue key card and I just gave up. <laughs> yeah. So I have to go back to that. And I really want to beat that game. And then I'll think about getting the next one. I just picked up F1 2019 on PC for oh. $17 on Steam. That is fun as hell. Nice. Um, uh, I love racing. That game is super fun. Like F1 simulation type thing. Yeah. And the career mode really kind of ropes you in and makes you do kind of really short press interviews. And oh, that's you funny. can bo- boost your team morale by answering questions a certain way. Uh, oh, my God. I just really kind of started scratching the surface on that, and that's super fun. But I've been playing the hell out of Shadowrun for Sega Genesis. Oh yeah, on my on my Raspberry Pi because I never beat it as a kid. It's oh, just such a I good think it game. was far too difficult. Yeah. Uh, when when I was a child, when I had a Genesis in the nineties, uh, but now with the advent of things like save states, I can actually beat the game because so much of that game is based on the pen and paper Shadowrun. The stats I think are pretty close to the same, and effectively most everything you do is a dice roll um so the more you level up your characters the more successful you are with combat and diving into the matrix in that game i don't know if you guys have played it oh yeah oh, um, that. so when you go into the matrix you actually have to f- a turn-based kind of fight against 
uh, computer terminals and access data cubes to download information that you can either sell or are the objectives of missions. And you have to upgrade your deck that you use to hack into the matrix. And um, I saved up enough money to get the best decker in, in the game in my party. And her name is Rihanna. Uh, she's an elf and she's incredible. And I got her the nicest deck and uh, just grinded a bunch of money selling data. You know what I'm talking about, Riley, right? Oh, yeah, dude, 100%. That, that data that data buyer and the Southwest uh, yep. Seattle map. Yep. Um, so I just, I, I kind of leveled up my characters to the point where I'm ready to finally progress through the story and, and beat the game. But it's one of the more, uh, it's one of the only games I know of for the 16-bit era that is really kind of a truly open world sandbox type thing. You hesitate to really call it a sandbox. It is an RPG with a story. But it doesn't handhold you. It gives you notes in a, a notebook on your, like a Pip Boy type thing, that you just have to kind of figure out. And it's almost like a, a crime procedural in a way, where you have to go find somebody in a bar, talk to them to get the next clue, and things like that. So, you know, for like an eight to twelve year old kid, that was just beyond my scope at the time. Yeah, hundred percent. That game is a testament to how Sega. Okay, so Sega in the nineties. And even in the early 2000s was a gaming company that was always too far ahead of their time. Yeah. Um, the Dreamcast. Dude, like a Dreamcast yeah. is what bankrupted them. And it's crazy because it's like they had. Do you remember the Dreamcast controller and how it had yeah. that? The fucking memory card for that thing was, was like it, it had it, the VMU. It had this, you know, for those of you who don't know. Uh, the Dreamcast controller, basically, the way the memory card worked was that it was like a tiny little portable, like, uh, like game console. It was like a tiny Game Boy that you could plug into your controller during gameplay. Um, and most games had some kind of functionality where you could load things into the VMU from the game while it was plugged into the controller and then pop it out and take it with you on the go uh and play it as like like a like a nano pet kind of thing like a like sonic adventure for example had a uh like a these little creatures that you could raise uh much like pokemon called chow chows and you put them all into this little chow garden and you could like upload certain chows from your garden into your vmu and then unplug your vmu from your controller and then like i said like like you know nano pet that shit and like feed it throughout the day and all this kind of stuff and then when you plugged it back into your controller and looked at it in your chow garden again all of its stats were raised and like to think that a game company was doing shit like that in the 90s is bananas like it is (laughs) totally insane but the thing about sega is that like they've always had like a critic like they they always have one thing that's like super advanced and then one critical flaw. And in the Dreamcast, it was that there was no burned disc protection. Um, so you could just go to Blockbuster or Hollywood Video or whatever now obsolete rental uh, storefront uh, at the time and just rent a Dreamcast game, put it onto a burned disc on your computer, and then you just like own the game. Ah. And, uh, and, and Sony, PlayStation had protection against that. Like you couldn't put a burned right. disc into a PlayStation one, you know, they had those like black disc protective things. Um, and you could get like a mod chip. If you knew someone who like, you know, worked at Sony and had the goods <laughs> and it was like, yeah. it was a whole like different thing, but yeah, dreamcast just didn't have that. And, uh, game companies back then only made revenue off games. Like the, the console cost was pretty much one to one to production. Um, so if, if you're not selling games, like you're, totally screwed uh, you know that that's something i seem to remember from when i worked at circuit city in high school was that consoles for the most part them on their own don't make money they're mostly as close to at cost as they can be sometimes they the even mo- lose the, money yeah yep. and the, the money is really made in the sale of accessories which is why uh, there's so many bundles that exist and they try to get you to buy extra controllers and things because yep. that's where the margins exist yep. and which is why nintendo has been on top of the game for Ever because Nintendo's accessory marketing has always been incredible. Um, yeah, but yeah, but Shadowrun is a perfect example of Sega ingenuity with a like to a fault. It's like, oh my god, this huge open world, like D and D esque game, like it, it appeals to so many different demographics and all this kind of stuff. But 
it was you know released in the wrong decade like right. if shadow run came out 10 years later uh i think that you know it would have become something even more iconic than it already was but it's like a cult classic you know what i mean like as far it, as sega and, games you go know, the, the shadow run games that are out now the turn-based kind of isometric uh style combat games they are, are cool i played them a little bit but man, how great would a GTA Five style Shadow Run that kind of oh, GTA God. Five mixed with? Um, it's essentially what Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven is going to be, right? But yeah, pretty if much. It w- if it's that Shadow Run universe with orcs and dwarves and humans and shamans, where it's kind of this mixed, I don't know. It's just got a really unique aesthetic that I've always really enjoyed. Yeah. Um, as far as you know, it, it's Dungeons and Dragons and World of Warcraft in the future is essentially what it is. Yeah, which is like a nerd wet dream. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's perfect. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Vince, you mentioned uh, you're playing that on a Raspberry Pi. Um, yeah. If there's people maybe that don't know what that is, uh, can you explain a little bit about what Raspberry Pi is? And and we're not trying to uh, promote uh, piracy here, but maybe even how to play some of these old school games that you already own a copy of, but you just want to you know play now. Yeah, because uh, I mean, a lot of people still, I still own a lot of cartridges, but it's either difficult or impossible to play them at this point. Right. So what Raspberry Pis are, they they have a ton of different applications. They're little mini computers, essentially. They're like $30, $40 online, and people use them to teach coding. A friend of mine uses it to run his entertainment center. Um, but you can ins- install a piece of software called, um, uh, what the heck is it called? Raspberry Pi. Um, Emulator? Retro Retro Pi is the software. Yep. Okay, and w- mm-hmm. within Retro Pi, you install uh, the emulators for all the different systems. And there's a lot of resources online for how to set them up. And as long as you're a little bit computer savvy with being able to mount all the um, the files to a uh, thumb drive to mm-hmm. plug into the Pi, uh, you're pretty much good to go. It didn't take me a long time to figure it out, but it's also one of those things too where I know some friends from college that set them up for people and not only are they used on tvs and things but people use them to run arcade cabinets that they build there's a a subreddit on reddit called cade just c-a-d-e where people show off their builds some people restore original arcade cabinets with the board from that arcade game with an old school crt monitor uh cr like tube tv with what was in the old arcade cabinets but people also build arcade cabinets with a modern monitor with joysticks and buttons. That's cool. And it's run by a Raspberry Pi. Nice. Uh, they're just they're modern multicades, and it's really cool. Um, so yeah, to have one of those around is just it's nice for travel. It's you know it, it's a little less it's a little more clunky than traveling with like an, a Nintendo Switch or something. But hey, when when you travel all, all over the world and you have to be in hotel rooms to have something like that, you can HDMI into a TV, and all of a sudden you're playing a version of Tecmo Super Bowl for NES with modern <laughs> NFL lineups and names. I mean, that just rules. That's awesome. And they they even have uh, like compact versions that you can you can build out. Like uh, I think they just use more often than not just like a PSP shell um, that you just pop Raspberry Pi. Uh, yeah, that's the thing, right? It's it's yep. the the board itself. You can put in any number of types of uh, housings and shells. Mm-hmm. There's a bunch of different types. Um, there's one that looks like a mini SNES that that's out there that you can just put around it because yeah you're just putting a protective shell around uh, this little board you don't, wouldn't even have to do that if you don't want to but you know you probably yeah. don't want a board just laying loose out so well and the great thing about neat. it is that even if you have you know copies like I'm a big time you know old school retro video game collector and even if you have copies of all this stuff like that hardware does not last forever right. you know what Definitely I mean not, like. No. Even if you have a working, you know, Sega Genesis or old school Nintendo or even farther back like Atari, uh, you know, and then like even if you somehow have, you know, a a very well maintained console, uh, the games themselves are all battery operated. Um, Right. So it's like if if you want to save. Yeah. If you want to save a game, you know, like if uh, so many times I've had copies of like the old Pokemon games for Game Boy or Game Boy Advance or old Super Nintendo games um, you know that are like RPG saved based or save based kind of stuff 
uh even not save base kind of stuff even stuff where it's just like you have your own file like the donkey kong games and the mario games and stuff mm-hmm. uh all that data is retained with like a like one of those circular like watch battery kind of deals right and they're easy enough to replace um but it's kind of a pain in the dick you know what i mean like you have to solder stuff and you need like a special tool for nintendo games like this weird star-shaped screwdriver that is nintendo proprietary and so it's like having technology available where you can just kind of you know download stuff and the other thing that's cool about it is that it's like there's all kinds of shaders and like graphic that's what i was uh, gonna say that that you can make and yeah the upscaling and the actual interface with a modern tv um i think a lot of those things correct me if i'm wrong have gotten fixed um, on the modern emulation versus so the games probably actually look better now on an emulator than they do actually probably actually play they really do it's you know it's so funny there's actually like it's gotten to a point where there's like purists right uh like retro game collector yeah uh, purists who things got like so good and so smooth that they were like man like i kind of miss the shitty the, frame like, rate and the, yeah. yeah the like slowdown of like yeah. it being overloaded because i'm playing you know metal slug and doing this like bullet hell kind of thing where there's so much going on that like it like clips you into slow motion for a little bit because <laughs> right. it just like can't handle it right and so uh you know there's there's companies out there that you know do cartridge recreate or recreations uh that like include that kind of stuff in there so you can pop it into an old school sega this like brand new fresh cartridge and still get those you know 90s uh problems <laughs> yeah that have since been solved and then you know turned back on to give you a more authentic experience um it's cool the whole retro game community is is pretty pretty awesome yeah we, we we've definitely we don't want for things to do in modern civilization this would have been a little bit different than the 70s i think so you know at, at least in that respect we're pretty lucky to have immediate access to just a, a, an array of things to do and ways to communicate it's, it's pretty cool totally. and hey like we said before streaming as far as i know is down overall with music yes. people aren't driving as much listening so you know, don't forget to put on some records every now and again. That's really all we ask. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> if you're playing Final Fantasy 14 all hours of the day and night like me, you know, open up open up a streaming service. Open up some Apple Music, Spotify, Google Play. Yeah. Support some uh some rad artists that are now in a position where we're having to be very creative with the ways that we uh, are keeping ourselves afloat. And hey, if you had a ticket for a show that was canceled and you got a refund, you know, maybe think about going to that band's merch store and picking up a, a t-shirt or something. Uh, that's, oh, yeah. that's still one way to really, a lot of that money goes directly to the band. So, you know, if if you can, if you have the means to support bands right now and buy merch or vinyl or anything uh you know obviously please do it because uh we're all gonna want to still go to shows when this is all over so yeah that's about it we're ready to wrap up this episode of the metal blade podcast thanks everybody for tuning in and uh follow metal blade on social media at metal blade on uh twitter at metal blade records on instagram and youtube and uh make sure to check out the blade brigade facebook group where uh, you can find out about all things metal blade and uh see some cool posts from uh, other you know super fans of metal blade cool awesome thanks so much for listening until next time everybody see ya